Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our third session of the Preparing for PSA series. Um, let me just bring up. So I've actually got um, Dr. Sona Petrosian, which is the lead for the prescribing series here um, with everybody. So this would be hopefully a really nice session where you guys could ask questions, um, which you would otherwise not be able to on YouTube. OK, so if I um, just move on to the next slide, really happy to be partnered and sponsored by Westlane. Um, again, they're an excellent company to help you on your first day of financial year training um, in terms of finances, your well-being and your other life planning. Um, and this is our team. So I'm Janice, I'm the lead for final year series. And of course, we have Dr. Sona Petrosian, which is the mastermind and lead for the whole prescribing PSA series. She's also a pharmacist by training. So please, please, please ask any questions that you can. Um, and then we have Salmia and Bellam Reed, who are both excellent um, chairs from the Intercalate, uh, sorry, from the Medical Education Society at Keele Medical School. And of course, we have Dr. Dosha, who's behind all the scenes at Mind the Bleep. So um, the next thing is we're actually recruiting penultimate or final year medical students to join um, our final year series surf team. And we're looking for representatives and um, the applications are actually now active. So if you guys follow the link on the slide, you guys can all apply and we really look forward to seeing your ideas and your application. And of course, before any series, this is our disclaimer. The PSA series for Mind the Bleep has been created by junior doctors who have a passion for teaching entirely on a voluntary basis. The aim is to teach from experience and help come the um, sort of exam anxieties. Um, the lecture slides and teaching content are accurate to the best of our knowledge um, that neither us or the Mind the Bleep team take responsibility for any inaccuracies. And please refer to the um, full terms and conditions on Mind the Bleep for your reference. Okay. So today, um, this is our session three on adverse drug reactions. This would be your section six in your PSA. So this is quite an important session and also quite easy to handle once you know the basics. Of course, upcoming, we have um, prescribing in medical emergencies and calculation skills. Um, and this would be um, the fourth and fifth session in the series. Um, and then upcoming, we also have medicine and surgery, information giving, ops and gynae, which will go through the um, oral contraceptives, GP psychiatry, drug monitoring, interpretation. And the last session would be Q&A, which is a final session to help everybody where that you can ask your last bits of questions before your exam. Again, we follow the blueprint from the PSA um, when we design the teaching sessions. And today we'll be focusing on adverse drug reactions. The structure would be, we'll be covering um, really common adverse drug reactions like renal liver impairment, common drugs, opioids, benzos, antipsychotics, um, imbalances in electrolytes, medication adjustments. Um, for the topics on DKA, DOEX, warfarin, these would be um, discussed in the drug monitoring um, sessions and also the medical emergency sessions. Um, I think from last time, a lot of people ask us, why do we switch between Medicine Complete and BNF? So BNF and BNF children is really great for treatment summaries. Um, and I feel like they're really good for like referencing in the exam. Medicine Complete, as um, Dr. Petrosian has pointed out in the first session, and I really, really encourage everybody to watch session one on YouTube, where she actually demonstrates how you use the interaction checker and how, why Medicine Complete is an easier um, and more user-friendly website. So um, for adverse drug reactions, there are four types of questions mainly. So you have type A, where you, they ask you actually about the specific adverse effect of um, different common drugs. For type B, it would be about um, like how the adverse, adverse drug reaction affects the body system, like the kidneys, the liver, electrolyte imbalances. And then type C would be your interactions. So your favorite best friend, um, CYP inducers and inhibitors. 
your type D would be um, a more sort of, you know, the drug reaction, but you have to plan the management in order to help the patient. So question one, we have a 58 year old woman in the gastro clinic who has been advised to start taking methotrexate 75 milligrams weekly for the treatment of IBD. The question is asking, please select the adverse effects that is most likely to be caused by this treatment. If you have medicines complete, please use medicines complete to complete this question and pause this video now um, before I review the answer in the next slide. So the answer to this question is leukopenia because it's asking for the adverse effects that's most likely to be caused by methotrexate. Um, in the next slide, I will show you how we use the interaction checker on Medicines Complete to find the answer. Um, but just something, some facts about methotrexate. Um, methotrexate is usually taken once a week. And if you take it with NSAIDs, it can precipitate low counts in platelets and it will affect your ability to um, clot whilst you're bleeding. If you take it with trimethoprim, which is commonly used in urinary tract infection, it can cause um, symptoms of bone marrow suppression and that would include having lower than normal white cell count, which would affect a person's ability to fight off infections, precipitating them to um, really significant infections caused by really simple um, bugs like strep pneumo or staphylococcus. And if you take methotrexate with um, proton pump inhibitors, um, because proton pump inhibitor is um, an inhibitor of the CYP enzyme, it can increase the level of methotrexate and increase the toxicity in the blood. So if I move on to the next slide, I will show you how you um, search for methotrexate in Medicines Complete. And um, in here, you could see that um, under the side effects, there is common or very common or uncommon. So for this question is asking for the most common um, and amongst all the options, leukopenia is the most common side effect. The side effects are or organized in alphabetical order. So um, if they're under common, they'll, they'll be of similar um, frequency of occurrence. If they're under uncommon, it means that the frequency of occurrence is actually quite uncertain. Let's do question two. Again, 50 seconds. So 50 seconds is up. Um, again, this question is actually taken from the official paper, but I made some changes. Um, so this is a patient who's on the urology ward reporting having difficulty hearing. Um, the past medical history includes um, really complicated UTI infection for two weeks, depression and hypertension. Um, and which of the prescription is most likely to have contributed to the hearing difficulty? The patient has normal renal function. Um, so I anticipate that this question might cause some debate, but I will go through this. So the correct answer is actually um, furosemide 80 milligrams intravenous over two minutes. If um, we look at this question, um, I think most, I think furosemide, a lot of patients do take it like orally and usually take it every day. And I don't see any patients get hearing loss or um, hearing difficulty. But if you pay attention that this is actually a drug that we're giving by the IV route over two minutes. So it's a rapid administration of furoxamide. So what is my reasoning here? Um, so if I search for furoxamide on Medicine Complete, and if we look at the monitoring requirements, and I particularly go for the renal impairment session. So they're saying that actually they don't recommend giving um, very fast furoxamide, um, actually not more than four milligrams per minute. You can give it, but you just need to balance the risk and benefits. And then the next slide, for side effects, because the question is asking for um, which of the following drug um, is most likely to cause hearing loss. With hearing loss, I think the PSA can be quite um, creative. So they wouldn't say which of the following drug is most autotoxic. They can say that, but um, they sometimes they would ask for hearing loss or hearing impairment. 
and sometimes they will ask for a deafness so you need to be you need to pay attention to the wording that they use in the question and with regards to the to the options in the questions when you search the drought use control f which brings up a little box for you to search for, for example, deafness. If the question is asking for deafness, then search for deafness. If the question is asking for hearing loss, then search for hearing loss or hearing impairment. So um, I think in this case, I think for intravenous furoxamide high dose, if you give it over a very, very high, very, very short time, for example, furoxamide 80 milligrams over two minutes, um, it can increase the risk of hearing impairment or hearing loss. Um, so with hearing loss or tototicity, um, the common drugs that you should be aware of would be gentamicin, so a, an antibiotic that you often see that is being started in hospital, bumetanide, which is a type of lip diuretic. So one milligram of bumetanide equates to 40 milligrams of furoxamide. And, there, and bumetanide, you often see them being used because they have better bioavailability than furoxamide and um, vancomycin. So these are the common drugs that you should remember. So when you do your PSA, if you see options like gentamicin, vancomycin, um, then you would probably go for gentamicin or vancomycin. Um, they don't usually come in the same question because that is really unfair if they do. Okay, let's do question three. Okay, so that's um, around one minute. Um, so Clostridium difficile, it's a really common question. And um, this question, the answer is actually Um So um, as we know, I think um, there are a few drugs that precipitate um, Clostridium difficile infection. And there are four main types of antibiotics um, that mainly cause it. And I will show you the um, a really clever diagram that is designed by um, Dr. Sona and um, our um, medical students leads from Kiel. Um, so basically, I think when patients use a lot of proton, proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole and soprazole, um, or they have low magnesium or low sodium, or they're on the um, common types of antibiotics, it can increase the risk of having clos C. diff. And the definition for C. diff is usually having more than or equal to two loose stools in 24 hours. And um, each hospital would have a very strict infection control guideline on that. Um, so if I bring you all to the diagram that we designed, um, so the four Cs, so clindamycin, comoxiclav, so profloxacin, cephalosporins, which include keftriaxone, kevlesin, can all increase the risk of um, Clostridium difficile infection and diarrhea. Okay, so let's do this question, everybody. Um, I've seen someone put in the answer already. So um, one of your colleagues have said clifromycin, and the correct answer is clifromycin. So I think um, in the session two of PSA series um, last week, um, which is on elderly care and pediatrics, um, we actually touched on CYP inducers in, and inhibitors. They are popular questions in the PSA because it's really easy to write and really, really important to know. Um, so in this case, clifromycin is the answer, which is an inhibitor which stops the body from breaking down symphostatin. And as we know, symphostatin um, can increase the risk of myopathy and leading to the pain in the arms and legs of this patient. Um, and I think um, because I, last time I think, um, I think we both of us feel that it might be easier like technologically um, to not do like switch screens and things. Um, and I really recommend you all to watch session one to see how it's done live. But this is what I did this time for this type of question. Let's say we don't actually know which drug causes um, 
this interaction i can't really memorize cyp for example then this is how you search for the interactions you literally enter amoxicillin press enter becomes a little box aspirin becomes a little box it doesn't really work if you do commas between the drugs because i tried that um and the most most easy the easiest way would be to type in drug name enter question five um so this is a question looking at how um what is causing the presentation so this question is actually being very kind because it tells you that it's potentially serotonin syndrome but let's say we don't actually get this information from the question stem so this patient presents with a headache nausea sweating and tremor and he's also taking citalopram um, on examination his dilated pupils and really really exaggerated reflex reactions and because of how accurate this patient was presented this is most likely um, serotonin syndrome um, and the question is asking which drug interaction actually causes serotonin syndrome and the answer is actually tramadol hydrochloride so let's say I, I really don't know what causes this interaction. How do we look for the answer? Again, you go to medicine complete. And this is what I did. I type in all the questions, including the um, drug from the question stem, which is citalopram, which the patient is on. I type in all the five options from the MCQ. And actually it's citalopram and tramadol that actually increases the risk of serotonin syndrome and the rest would cause CNS depressant effects. So like drowsiness, unable to answer questions, um, like sluggish reaction to pain, for example, would be CNS depressant effects. Um, and any questions so far? I, I saw one question already, um, but any questions about the question that does not make sense? Okay, so I will gently move on. Um, so common toxic effects, um, I think because of how limited amount of time we have today, we can't really go through all the questions, but common um, toxic effects would be opioids. So like opioid overdose, it's very common, commonly asked in the PSA. And in the question, Sam, you often see someone with really small pinpoint pupils, um, maybe not re uh, responding to any questions or any voice or pain. Um, you noted that the they're briefing at around maybe five or six per minute rather than 12 to 13 per minute. And usually the antidote would be intramuscular nanoxone 400 micrograms every two to three minutes. Um, and this would be the antidote. And you repeat that every two, three minutes. Um, and also remember to call for help in real life. Um, if you really, really can't remember um, most of the drugs like benzos or amphetamine, etc., in Medicines Complete or BNF, just search for poisoning, and then the treatment summary would come up. And you would see common um, toxic uh, reactions to drugs that would help you in the exam. And I've put in this diagram just to help us put in 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 our mind like official representation of what the pupils look like for different common drugs. Opioids typically cause small pupils. Big pupils would be caused by um, LSD. Um, some opiates, which is quite unusual, cocaine, um, LSD, etc. Okay, so question six. This is about a 35-year-old woman who attends her GP for a medication review. Um, she's currently just been started on um, microgynon 30. And the question is asking for you to see which drug is most likely to interact with microgynon 30 to reduce the contraceptive effect. If you like to use Medicines Complete, please do. And please pause the video before I review the answer in the next slide. The answer to this question is phenytoin 150 milligrams PO daily. If you take this with microgynon, it's very likely to interact with um, the oral contraceptive. 
Um, and phenytoin, as we know, is a very potent CYP enzyme inducer, and it can increase the breakdown of the oral contraceptive um, in the body. So if someone is on phenytoin in terms of contraceptive, you might want to recommend them using intrauterine devices like the copper IUD instead of oral contraceptives. So some um, mnemonics to help everybody to remember. With regards to inducers, carbamazepine, so think CAR, it's quite easy to uh, mix this up with carbamazole, so be very careful. Carbamazole is not an inducer. So you have your common barbiturates, your cabamazepine, your phenytoin, your rifampicin, um, and your pioglitazone are all common inducers. Again, the same um, infographic by the same medical students that I found online. Um, CYP450 inhibitors, common ones include proton prom inhibitors. So that's why you use um, lansoprazole when a patient is on clopidogrel. Lansoprazole is found to have less of an inhibitor or even no inhibitor effect on um, patients who are on clopidogrel compared to omeprazole. Amiodarone, SSRIs, grapefruit juice, cementidine, think cement, which is like a block that stops, so inhibitors stop, this is how we remember it, um, macrolides, um, these can all cause um, the um, reduced effect of drugs. So question seven. This is about a 45-year-old man who's present to the emergency department with tremors, muscle rigidity, and a slowing in his movements. He has newly diagnosed schizophrenia. He has recently just started haloperidol five days ago. It has now been stopped. Please select the most appropriate option for the management of this adverse drug event. Before I review the answer, please pause this video, and I will review the answer in the next slide. So the correct answer is procyclidine, um, hydrochloride 2.5 milligrams oral eight hourly. So this patient actually presents with symptoms of drug induced Parkinsonism is very common in antipsychotics. Um, so I think during the live webinar, a lot of people ask us um, how much um, pre-knowledge do we need for the PSA without overly relying on using the BNF and Medicines Complete? I think um, just a rule of thumb before the PSA is really good to know and be aware of what treatment summaries there are um, on the BNF and Medicines Complete. So during the exam, you have a quite a rough idea of where to look for the answer if you can't just um, search for a certain drug. We actually found if you search for Parkinsonism in the BNF, procyclidine actually comes up as an option. Um, but there are also a few other drugs that might be um, available. So I think for this question, procyclidine is one of the options. For revision purposes, now you know that for drug-induced Parkinsonism, procyclidine is a very common drug option. So um, hopefully this webinar helps you in some ways, but for your finals, this is certainly a common question that comes up. And with regards to neuromagnetic syndrome and serotonin syndrome, again, I found a really helpful table to help everybody to remember. Um, NMS, it's commonly um, associated with antipsychotics and a common um, symptom would be diffuse rigidity um, with really dampened reflexes. So in terms of the management of NMS, actually, um, in terms of the BNF, we found that if you search for the psychosis and related disorders treatment summary, this is the page. And then within there, you because I'm using a Mac, so I used um, Command F on my Mac. But in a Windows computer, it would be Control F. And then if you search for a neuroleptic, actually the paragraph on neuroleptic malignant syndrome appears under the treatment summary for psychoses and related disorders. And then in there, you could see that bromocryptin and dantrolin have been used for treatment. So if this question comes up in um, section one prescribing, then you, all you need to do is search for bromocryptin or dantrolin and check for the um, necessary dose um, and duration for that symptom for NMS. So um, just a summary table for adverse um, effects of common drugs like benzodiazepines. 
um, antipsychotics. So um, I think for antipsychotics in particular, for typical ones like chlorpromazine or haloperidol, um, apart from drug-induced Parkinsonism, we're also worried about acute dystonia and also tardive um, dyskinesia. And most commonly, I think for um, atypical antipsychotics, which are the newer, newer antipsychotics like quetiapine or lansipine, they most commonly um, causes gain in weight. Um, so for example, if you see stem saying patient has just got diagnosed with schizophrenia, um, which of the following most likely causes her weight gain? So if olanzapine comes up, it's most likely the answer. Again, they wouldn't mix um, two possible atypicals together in the same question um, as an option because that would be unfair, um, just like the inhibitors and inducer question. And for they actually for olanzapine, quetiapine, atypicals can increase your risk of getting diabetes and also rise in serum lipids. So I think um, the drug monitoring um, session in the PSA series would touch upon more on this to see what we do before we start someone on a drug and how we monitor someone. And with the typicals, which are the old ones, um, which include chlorpromazine, haloperidol, they commonly causes um, really sustained muscle contraction. And you also see like restlessness, and you could also see tardive dyskinesia, which um, some patients would do facial grimacing, lip smacking. And um, sometimes you do see that in, in patients. And these are um, the benzoyls, antipsychotics, um, and really useful to know for it, your PSA and your finals exam. The next slide, um, I've included three diagrams because I think the common theme is the foot and the QT interval. So for example, um, for calcium channel blockers like amlodipine, it actually increases your risk of ankle swelling. So if you see someone coming in, he has hypertension. However, he complains of increased ankle swelling. Um, how should you adjust the medication? It, they could either ask you to stop a medication whereby you would stop amlodipine, or they would say, they've already stopped amlodipine. What would you do, um, et cetera? And maybe in the options, they would say, stop amlodipine and start an alternative. Um, or they would say reduce the dose of amlodipine, which you know it's not recommended because amlodipine, if it causes ankle swelling, it might not be directly related to how much amlodipine you're on. So this is how I would think of how the questions could come up. Um, and then following on from the um, idea of um, drug affecting the foot, and now think about finals, it can increase your risk of tendon rupture, most commonly in the alkalis tendon in your ankles, or it could be in your elbow. And um, I will show you the page on the BNF later to see where I got the evidence from. So if you're on steroids like prednisolone and you're on ciprofloxacin, it actually increases your risk of tendon rupture. Um, so it's it's quite nice for them to write a question on this and say which of the following drugs when combined with ciprofloxacin actually increases the risk of tendon rupture. If you see prednisolone compared to others, that would probably be the answer. Again, if you're unsure, just use the interaction check and see if that comes up. Quinolones also increases your QT interval. Um, and it also reduces your seizure threshold, threshold. So it's easier for you to get seizures if you're on anti-epileptics. So be aware of that um, interaction. This is the evidence that I want to show everybody. Like, why do we say if you use steroids with ciprofloxacin increases the risk of tendon rupture? So what I did was I, I searched for ciprofloxacin in the BNF or the medicine complete. And I use control F. So if you're using a Mac, it will be command F. Um, command button and F, and then you will be able to type in the search box for tendon damage in ciprofloxacin um, page, and then you would find the interaction. So commonly you see questions like patients have an AKI, so acute kidney injury. Um, you often see in the bloods, they would show a rise in creatinine compared to before, a decrease in EGFR. Um, and this, if they're on AC inhibitors like Remipril and so Lansopril, etc. This might be the drug that you want to hold for now. And then for metformin, um, really common question to be asked as well, because commonly a lot of patients are on metformin. If their EGFR is below 30, sometimes the drug is withheld. Um, and then they would do the um, renal function test again, maybe in a few days to see if they can put the patient back on metformin again.
summary slide. So in summary, after this session, you'll be able to use the interaction checker in Medicines Complete to look for adverse drug reactions in common drug interactions. You'll be able to further understand the adverse effects of common CYP enzyme inducers and inhibitors, in particular when someone is using oral contraceptives. You'll be able to further understand common drug and mode of administration that is associated with autotoxicity causing hearing loss or hearing impairment. You'll be more aware of the common drugs and the four C's um, mnemonic to remember um, how they are associated with Clostridium difficile diarrhea. You'll be more familiar with the adverse drug effects of antipsychotics, in particular drug-induced Parkinsonism and um, the treatment which is procyclidine very commonly. You'll be more aware of the adverse effects of commonly prescribed drugs like metformin and its impact on renal function, amlodipine and its relationship with ankle swelling, quinolones um, and their relationship with um, increased risk of tendon rupture and prolonged QR interval, benzoyl overdose and opioid overdose and how you manage them. Next up, we actually have a session on medical emergencies, which I really, really recommend you all to attend it live um, because sometimes attending it live means you get to ask us questions and you get to practice it in real time. You also get to revise for finals, which is really common to see medical emergencies. Session five um, is in December the 1st and where we go through really key calculation skills and harder calculation questions, um, which is also a session in the PSA. Please, please, please give us feedback. Um, it's not only important um, for us going ahead, improving sessions, we actually act on them and improve the sessions for you guys. 